This is part two of my consideration of the theory that the Eye of the Sahara, or the reshot structure, is the location of the lost city of Atlantis, as presented by Bright Insight in three of his videos. The Lost City of Atlantis Hidden in Plain Sight, The Lost City of Atlantis Hidden in Plain Sight Part 2, and Ancient Map Shows the Lost City of Atlantis is the Eye of the Sahara. Most of the information presented by Bright is taken from a documentary made back in 2011 by George S. Alexander and Natalis Rosen called Visiting Atlantis, which is on the Gaia website, though Bright does present a few ideas of his own. If you haven't seen part one of my discussion, I recommend you do that first before watching this one. I'll leave a link for you below. Bright responds to some common objections to his theory in his videos. Let's take a look at each of them. An objection to the theory that Bright tries to answer is, why is the reshot structure so far from the sea? As you can see from any map, the reshot structure is hundreds of miles from any shore. Bright responds to this by saying that Plato says Atlantis is now landlocked, so it's to be expected. Consider Plato's exact words in regards to the aftermath of the cataclysm. Quote, Atlantis is part of the Atlantic which is no longer accessible by ship. Atlantis, when sunk by the earthquake, became an impassable barrier of mud to voyagers sailing from hence to any part of the ocean. In other words, it became landlocked. Again, if this is the site of Atlantis, and if the details shared by Solon and Plato are true, and if the Ricart structure was the site of Atlantis, then it's not hard to see that perhaps a lot of sand or mud was pushed into Africa from the ocean during some sort of catastrophic event. However, the document doesn't really say that Atlantis is landlocked. Critias says that it is a mud barrier that prevents ships from getting from Greece to the Atlantic Ocean. That's not the same as landlocked. Bright also makes the astounding claim that previous to Atlantis' destruction 12,000 years ago, most of West Africa was submerged. But some will say that the Recot could not have increased to its current elevation of nearly 1,300 feet in just 12,000 years. So we must evaluate empirical scientific data to understand what could be geologically possible over the course of some 12,000 years. Let's consider the example of Antarctica that I used in my prior video and the fact that the continent is rising at a rate of 1.6 inches per year as a result of subsurface activity. 1.6 inches a year. Well, do the math on the Recot's elevation and you will see that even if it was uplifted at a slower rate than Antarctica, it is well within the possibility over this length of time. And here you can see just a few different examples of several outstanding comments I received from viewers who pointed this out and shared their own calculations. Now, using those calculations, take a look at what the area would look like when you account for the difference in elevation and sea level. These images you are seeing are from floodmap.net. Go there and play with the numbers and tell me that this isn't incredibly interesting. Um. Did you notice that Bright makes a correlation between the rising of Antarctica and the proposed rising of Africa without consideration for the reason why Antarctica is rising and how long it has been rising? He's very much interested in the part of the article's title that says Antarctica is getting taller, but not interested at all in the here's why part. I mean, if you want to show that Africa has risen by using these findings about Antarctica, You'd want to demonstrate that whatever phenomenon is making Antarctica rise exists in Africa. You can't just say, well, this is a continent, and so is that. Whatever happens to one continent can happen to any continent. That simply isn't true. In the very second paragraph of the article, it is said quite clearly that the reason Antarctica is rising is because as ice melts, its weight on the rock below lightens. And over time, when enormous quantities of ice have disappeared, the bedrock rises in response, pushed up by the flow of the viscous mantle below Earth's surface. Is this happening in Africa? No. No ice. And the phenomenon is happening in Antarctica because of the increase in temperature caused by climate change. This is a recent phenomenon. 
Yet Bright wants us to believe that it has been happening to Africa for 12,000 years. When people were making calculations about how far Africa would have to rise, did they take into consideration that the water level during the Younger Dryas was 70 meters lower than it is today? Now, some will look at these flood maps and say, well, yeah, you're just playing with numbers here to make the scenario work. But we're really not, because the known scientific evidence is that the Recot structure was uplifted by subsurface magma chambers, thus increasing the surrounding elevation. Hmm, now he gives a completely different reason for the rising of Africa than the rising of Antarctica. Go figure. But you know what? Talking about how the Reshot structure was made does not explain how the entirety of West Africa rose. And not to mention, there is additional evidence of widespread subsurface volcanic activity in the region. As we can see in the examples of the nearby Canary and Cape Verde Islands, which are just off the coast of West Africa. So clearly, the subsurface activity is widespread and has been ongoing for a considerable length of time. I can't tell if Bright thinks this constitutes proof that all of West Africa rose from the sea, or if he's just pointing out the possibility. But all of that is really irrelevant. We already know what the coastline of Africa looked like 11,000 years ago. Not much different than it is today. Not being a geologist, well, even if he were a geologist, he would need to provide scientific evidence that such a thing actually happened. As far as I know, there is no single geological study that has ever concluded such a thing about this part of Africa. But there are hundreds that contradict it. Just from a preliminary investigation that I made for this video, I learned that the Sahara Desert began forming 7 million years ago when the tectonic plates of Africa and Eurasia collided and the Tethys Sea started shrinking. The region around the eye of the Sahara was arid during the last glacial maximum between 22,000 and 14,500 years ago. The desert was actually bigger than it is today. Then we enter what is called the African Humid Period between 14,500 and 5,500 years ago when a wobble of the earth on its axis created wetter conditions for a few thousand years. This caused the Sahara to retreat to a certain extent, and yes, for part of that time, Mauritania was a grassland. I'll leave links to this information below the video for you to check. Bright should have mentioned this, as it lends weight to his argument that the area around the Rishat was not a desert. The only problem is, that area was not under the sea, and the area remained habitable for a long time after the Younger Dryas. Above ground and with continued occupation and vegetation, people lived there without disruption, as is evidenced from the datable artifacts that have been found there. And not only that, doesn't the entire region look like it was blasted by flowing water or a tsunami? You can see the striations in the land going from west to east from the ocean. Tell me that this doesn't look like a massive wave or a steady flow of water completely altered the terrain. Here Bright uses an argument that contradicts his other argument. If, as he said, this part of Africa was underwater before Atlantis was hit with destruction, then a tsunami would not have blasted this ground. It would not have slapped it and carved lines into it because it would have been on the ocean floor. And something else we should consider is that the sands of the Sahara actually originate from the sea. An interesting fact that many people are not aware of. This is not a fact, and in fact is a falsehood. The sand of the Sahara is just weathered rock. Closer to the shore, yeah, you're going to get some deposits that have washed up onto the beach. It's possible that some beach sand gets blown into the desert. Yeah, uh, these particles can often come from long distances because the wind blows them, sometimes from several hundred miles away. But most of it from the Sahara is from the Cretaceous limestone that existed there long ago and which has experienced wind erosion for millions of years. George S. Alexander in the Visiting Atlantis video says that it's weird that erosion would occur in a dry place. He says, one thing is clear, the place has been severely eroded and washed out. Interesting for one of the driest places on earth. I'm glad Bright at least didn't repeat this because the comment shows that Alexander has never even heard of wind erosion which is common in the desert. I'm no geologist, and even I know that. This information is widely available, so it certainly seems deceptive for Alexander to use it as evidence that there was an ocean in Mauritania 11,000 years ago. 
The seashells in the desert are from millions of years ago as well. You see the danger in taking things out of context? Then they also mentioned that there is evidence that this region was under the ocean far more recently than the tens of millions of years that some people claim, as non-fossilized whale bones have been found in the desert of Mauritania. And this example you're seeing here should not be confused with a different discovery in the Egyptian desert of actual fossils of whale bones. And you can clearly see the difference for yourself, as fossils are essentially bones that over millions of years became stone. So, if scientists claim that it takes more than a million years for bones to become fossils, why are there non-fossilized whale bones in the desert of Mauritania? You want to see exactly where these whale bones were discovered? Where this picture was taken? I'll show you. Right here. Yeah. Right on the coast, right next to the ocean. You know, where whales live. This whale washed up on the beach. They were not found deep in the desert of Mauritania, as Bright suggests. George S. Alexander adds to this and says, In exploring the eye of Africa, we were shown ancient fishing equipment, as well as stone rings that were used thousands of years ago. They resembled the same shape and design we'd seen the fishermen at the coast use to bind and weigh down their nets. It was explained to us how these and other artifacts were once used for fishing. This was further evidence to us that what is now 400 kilometers inland may have once been a place by the sea. During the African humid period, there were lakes in the area, and yes, fishing took place in them. So there's nothing unusual in finding fishing implements in the area. Now, since the tools Alexander refers to are unprovenanced, it's difficult to determine their age. But one thing is certainly true. These fishing tools are not exclusive to ocean fishing. The biggest objection that both Alexander and Bright try to address is that there are no ruins of a civilization at the Rishad structure. Alexander implies that the structure itself is some kind of remains, or at least that it's not a natural formation. He says, Ground observations could not provide consensus among researchers about the origins of the magnificent structure. Some scientists thought it was a massive impact crater, but the lack of shock-altered rock questions that theory. Others proposed that it was formed by volcanic activity like a volcano before eruption that ran out of energy and collapsed into itself. The debate of its formation rages on. This kind of presentation is often used by a non-specialist promoting an alternative hypothesis to the public. They'll point to the existence of more than one explanation as evidence that scientists can't come to an agreement. Scientists, like historians, are always proposing new theories. It's what they do. But Alexander is mistaken that there's no consensus on the reshot structure. It's true that there have been different hypotheses offered over the years, such as that the structure was created by an impact or even lightning strikes. But the general consensus is that it is of endogenic origin, that is, from beneath the earth. Fission track dating has indicated a date of origin in the Upper Cretaceous period, which would be between 166 million years ago. Bright acknowledges that the structure isn't man-made and that Atlantis could simply have been built upon it. So the origins of the structure are not all that important for our discussion, and we'll move on. Bright says the reason no buildings have been found is because no one has gone looking. Okay, I suppose it's possible that something is there beneath the sands, but you'd expect that if there was a magnificent city there, there would be something poking out somewhere. And there isn't. In his third video, Bright points to something he found on Google Earth. He says this, Look at this one located in the center island of the Rikot. It almost looks like the outline of a castle or something. Perhaps there is a simple explanation for it, but I might be willing to pay several hundred US dollars just to see a photo of what this looks like from the ground. Okay, but is there any indication of the age of that, quote, castle, unquote? Tell us when it's from. In their video, they show footage of many different artifacts that have been found in and around the Rikot, including gold jewelry, arrowheads, even stone weights that resemble ones that are commonly used with fishing nets. They even found hundreds of stone spheres cut with unbelievable precision. All of these artifacts were found in and around the Rikot at surface level, which again, is in the middle of nowhere, proving that at some point in the distant past, people did live there. Alexander goes a step further. 
Some of those remnants are ancient stone spheres, which could have served an artillery function. They have a flattened side, so they can be stored without rolling about. You can assume that they were not used by some lone hunter, but kept in shelves in large numbers and used in organized warfare. It would have been a most effective method of defense. This type of artillery may have also been used in naval warfare. A lot of those stone spheres have been found in and around the Recod. This gives us further evidence for an ancient, sophisticated society in the area with a proper military set up in place. So, merely from the existence of these unprovenanced stone spheres with a flattened side, Alexander is able somehow to extrapolate that they were cannonballs used on naval vessels of an advanced military society 11,000 years ago. Doesn't that sound to you a bit like reaching? Now, I can't speak as to when and where these artifacts came from, but neither can Bright nor Alexander. Where is the evidence for the date of these artifacts? I mean, when they come from is just as important as where they come from. Where's the appeal to archaeological provenance or carbon dating or seriation dating or any of the other methods that scientists use to date artifacts? Nowhere does either Bright or Alexander present scientific evidence to support their conclusions. No scientific studies are cited, whether geological, archaeological, historical. They give the impression that they're simply spitballing. And since they don't refer to any past research done by geologists on the area, they're at the very least giving the appearance that they have little to no knowledge of the subject. Which is strange, because why would someone make a documentary before completing their research of a subject. What we should expect is a theory to be tested first and then publication to follow. You don't make a documentary before you've completed your research. Alexander says the copper artifacts found in the area could be as old as Atlantis. How does he know this? Well, because, he says, copper has been used a long time. So the logic is, because copper usage could be old, these artifacts must be old. He doesn't go into the history of copper metallurgy in the area. He doesn't show evidence for the age of these copper artifacts. He just assumes. Not really the work of a scientist. If he knew that the earliest evidence of human use of copper in the world only goes back to 8000 BCE, then maybe he wouldn't have said anything. Recent work using thorough and systematic methods and taking into account all of the data done by a archaeometallurgist from the University of Arizona, Thomas Fenn, has indicated that copper trade in the Sahara did begin earlier than we thought. We used to think it began around the 7th or 8th century CE, but it turns out it goes all the way back to about 400 CE. Yeah, it's a little later than I'm sure Alexander would like to hear. Another piece of evidence Alexander presents has to do with the Dogon people an ethnic group from the Mali region of West Africa. He says that the Dogon have scientific knowledge they must have gotten from an ancient advanced civilization. He appears to have gotten his information from a travel blogger named Carrie Harvey, because in his video he shows her article, Dogon Knights, Ancient People Live by Cosmic Truth, while talking about this. Alexander says, It is believed that for eons, the Dogon had known that Sirius was a binary star system, where two suns are orbiting around each other, Sirius A and Sirius B. Obviously, with the naked eye, this is impossible to notice. The Dogon further knew that it takes 50 years for one orbit to complete. You would need fine astronomical equipment to pick this up, which the Dogon certainly did not have. Interesting that he uses the passive voice. It is believed here. It is believed by whom? Anyway, he's being highly misleading here. The Dogon don't believe that Sirius is a binary star system, at least not according to the article by Kerry Harvey. They believe it is trinary, three stars. And that doesn't match with science after all. Alexander explains this discrepancy away by saying, the Dogon knew that there are other objects in the Sirius star system much smaller than Sirius A and B. There is until now no conclusive scientific proof of its existence. Our technical equipment is as yet not advanced enough to confirm or deny this. So, he is willing to believe that the Dogon are right about the third star. Notice how Alexander avoids calling it a star, so as not to take away from his claim they believed in a binary system. And that scientists just haven't found it yet. 
But you can't establish the Dogon belief as in harmony with science by saying that science has yet to confirm their belief. Alexander also makes this statement. Further, the Dogon knew that the one star, Sirius B, is actually a white dwarf star. They describe the dwarf star as the smallest thing but also the heaviest. The Dogon description of this actually brings the matter to the point much better than our lengthy explanations. He credits the Dogon with knowing about white dwarf stars because they say that Sirius B is the smallest thing but also the heaviest. That's not the same as knowing what a white dwarf is. He tries to gloss over this by suggesting that their simple explanation is superior to a scientific one. Alexander admits that scholars explain that some of the information that the Dogon and other tribes possess was obtained through cultural contamination, meaning they came in contact with travelers from Europe and picked up some of their ideas. In answer to this, Alexander says, however, there are other African cultures who have the same ancient knowledge about the star Sirius that was held long before the arrival of the white man and his telescopes in Africa, but he doesn't say who. What cultures? Where is your evidence of these cultures knowing about this? You only brought up the Dogon. That was your best example. Where are the other ones? Where are the ones that show that they knew about it long before the arrival of the white man? I don't know of any documents from West Africa that come from before the arrival of the white man that say any such thing. So what are you talking about? Alexander thinks that cultural contamination is far less plausible than that this ancient knowledge that the Dogon and other West African cultures may have may stem from a previously highly developed civilization 11,000 years ago. I guess 11,000 years of oral transmission of information is more reliable than 100 years of oral transmission. The thinking behind the Atlantis theory presented by Alexander and Bright is euhemerist. What is euhemerism? It's the belief that the stories about the gods, myths, are based on actual historical events involving real people. That is why, for example, he and Bright speak as though the god Poseidon and his mythical children were real people. In Visiting Atlantis, Rosen says, Each culture has some form of mythology. Myth stems from legend, and legend from history. Often threads of truth are spread into the storytelling that makes up myths and legends. This statement expresses the euhemerist point of view. I have a full article on my blog on euhemerism and its fallacies, for which I will leave a link in the description below the video. But suffice it to say, for now, this statement is not borne out by the evidence. Myths and legends are differentiated by the fact that myths feature the gods and legends feature humans as the protagonists. They developed contemporaneously. So no, one did not lead to the other. Legends are stories that people tell about their past, and they often can have historical antecedents. But myths are an entirely different genre. Myths explain the origins of various things in nature, of various customs and practices. People can compose stories about the gods without those gods having to have existed. It is possible and even common for myths to be products of the human imagination. But even legends, which have a historical kernel of truth, need to be approached with some skepticism, right? They might feature actual historical figures or not. How do you tell what parts of legend are based in reality and what parts are not? You have to be very careful about that. And if you just accept them as a whole, like they're completely true, you're denying the fictional element of legend, which is definitely there. Is Atlantis a myth or a legend? Well, in my last video, I called the Atlantis tale a myth. And that's because it features gods and demigods, but there aren't really any human protagonists in it. It speaks in generalities, and it explains how certain things came to be. So I think it falls neatly into the category of myth. Plus, we know that Plato is likely to have made it up, though I do acknowledge that some people do call it a legend. As evidence that myths come from history, Alexander gives two examples of, quote, how history became legend and legend became myth, unquote. The two examples are the Trojan War and the Angkor or Khmer Empire. He says that these were myths that had proven to be true. Therefore, he asserts myths do come from history. First of all, is it reasonable to assume that because two myths have been shown to be based on history, that therefore 
all myths are based on history? No, because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of myths from throughout the world, and the vast majority of them have never been shown to be based on history, and many of them are historically and scientifically impossible to be true. Moreover, his examples don't actually prove what he wishes them to prove. The Trojan War is a legend, not a myth, because although it has gods in it, the protagonists are humans. The Khmer Empire was neither a myth nor a legend. We just had villagers saying they knew of ruins in the jungle and people not believing them. That doesn't fit the definition of a myth or a legend. Now yes, the Trojan War legend proved to be based on a historical event. That is so. It is not the only legend that can be said about, but that doesn't make all legends real. Sure, we can entertain the possibility that a legend is based on history. Nothing wrong with that, as long as it fits history. But we shouldn't assume its truth from the get-go and then try to make history fit it. You want to hear another fascinating detail? So the legend of Atlantis states that it was an empire made up of 10 kingdoms and the island of Atlantis was the capital. And the god Poseidon gave birth to five sets of twins, so 10 children, and each one of those children went on to rule each one of those 10 kingdoms. So allegedly Poseidon had five sets of twins. Does anyone want to guess what part of the world has the highest birth rate of twins per capita? Nigeria. That is one interesting fact considering its geographical proximity to Mauritania and the Rickhardt structure. I mean, think about what he is suggesting here. People in Nigeria today have a higher birth rate for twins because they're descendants of Poseidon? Under the assumption that Atlas, the son of Poseidon and first king of Atlantis, was a real person, Bright suggests that he should be identified with an Atlas from another story, Atlas the king of Mauritania. He then suggests that the Atlas Mountains, which are believed to be named for Atlas the king of Mauritania, or vice versa, are to be connected with Atlantis. One of Herodotus' notable achievements was developing what was then the most accurate mapping of the known inhabited world at the time of 450 BC. If you look to the left, what do you see there? That's right, the word Atlantis, which is shown to be located south of the Pillars of Hercules, or the Strait of Gibraltar, and positioned in Northwest Africa. It just so happens to be in the exact location that is annotated on an ancient map that was created by who we refer to as the Father of History. I mean, this is an X marks the spot if there ever was one. First, I should point out that we don't possess any map made by Herodotus. The maps we find on the internet or in books that are said to be by Herodotus are modern maps based on the descriptions in Herodotus' book. Not every modern interpretation of Herodotus is the same, so you'll see a bit of variety in these maps. But despite the title of Bright Insight's video, the ancient map he refers to doesn't exist. In Herodotus' book, the Atlantes refers to people who live in the area near the Atlas Mountains. In other words, they're called the Atlantes because they live near the Atlas Mountains. That's what these people put on the map, like the Garamantes and others here. These are all people that Herodotus says live in the area. I see nothing objectionable about the suggestion that there could be a connection between the Atlas Mountains, or the people called the Atlantes, and the city or island of Atlantis. That's a reasonable conclusion. I would even go so far as to say that the Eye of the Sahara could be one of the bases of the Atlantis legend. It's entirely possible that the ancient Greeks encountered it at some point in their travels. Perhaps a Greek explorer or trader. It's within the realm of possibility that the reshot structure was interpreted by these Greeks as the remains of an extinct city. I'd be willing to entertain any of those ideas, as I'm sure most historians would. But saying that the reshot structure was one of the inspirations for the Atlantis tale is not the same as saying it truly was Atlantis. While the absence of the material remains of a great city in the region, and the distance of the site from the sea, and its failure to fit the description from Plato's writings are all major objections to this theory, there's more than that. This hypothesis requires the rejection of the scientific consensus on a number of points. One, that 11,500 years ago, humans were in the midst of the Stone Age, with no settlements larger than a few hundred people. Yet we hear Bright saying that at this time, Atlantis had a fleet of 1,200 warships. 
They had horse races, widespread trade, and visitation, and the population of Atlantis was over a million people. 2. That urbanism first occurred around 3700 BCE in Mesopotamia after a long period of slow growth of the size of settlements. 3. That the various technologies purported to exist in Atlantis, such as agriculture, iron smelting, horse riding, shipbuilding, artillery, writing, etc., had not yet been invented. 4. That the coastline of Africa was much as it is today at the end of the Younger Dryas. Now, Bright seems well aware that this theory contradicts most or all of these established facts. And all of this has been building upon the videos I've been making since the beginning of this channel, which is that what we were taught in school about our true ancient past is far from it and that we were far older and advanced than we ever thought. He wants his viewers to reject all of these generally held ideas. But a good working hypothesis is not one that exists at the expense of so many other commonly accepted facts. If they want people to accept their hypothesis, they must first systematically dismantle all of these accepted facts in a convincing way. Only then could their hypothesis gain any traction. But until then, we can set aside this Atlantis theory as contradictory to both history and science. Thank you for watching. If you're interested in seeing more of these kinds of videos, please consider subscribing to show your support.